I'm going to read something that I've never read from this book. I generally read either the first chapter because you don't have to set it up or the fifth chapter because it's super sad and so I get to like see everyone's faces kind of crack and it makes me feel like a really good writer. But um, I'm going to read the seventh chapter which I've never done before but it, it has kind of everything I hear the young kids like. It's got a little, a little sex, a little bit of drugs, a little McDonald's. Um, it's got uh, little drugs. And and um, the the book was introduced so nicely. I don't think I have to set it up much. Karen has stage four ovarian cancer and a son named Jake. And this this uh, scene takes place right after uh, Jake met Dave, his father, for the very first time. They're taking a ferry to Friday Harbor. So this part of the book takes place in Seattle, and Seattle is. Um, ringed, like Puget Sound has these wonderful islands and this in them and, and this terrific ferry system um, that leaves from Anacortes and, and you the views are beautiful and the ferries themselves are there are always people playing Scrabble on them. So that's where we are. You were oh and one more thing, as um, Sam and Annie said, the the book is a, she's always talking to her son Jake. You were silent on the ferry, which was fine. So was I. We left the car on the ground floor and took a booth in the upstairs interior cabin by the window to watch the horizon leach out toward China. I was so tired I could barely think. You were reading one of the Jedi Apprentice books and pulling french fries idly from a McDonald's bag. Under normal circumstances, I never let you have McDonald's, but on the drive up, you were hungry and my defenses were shot. Do you want to talk about him? I asked, after a long, silent while. I've been reading the Friday Harbor tourist brochures, the words melting on the page. You shook your head, ate another fry. You sure? You f your eyes flickered upward. Today you had grown older, and the age showed, the age showed in your posture, your half-annoyed expression. You seemed tired, too, and you didn't like to be interrupted while you were reading. I'm going to go get some coffee. You nodded at me went back to your book. The ride was placid, not too many kids running around. A couple sitting at a table near us was playing Scrabble on a big magnetic board. Another woman behind them listened to headphones while nursing a baby. I stood up to head toward the snack bar in the middle of the cabin, holding onto the backs of other people's chairs in case the boat swayed. I knew the boat wouldn't sway, but I held on tightly anyway, too tightly. I'd been doing my breathing exercises all afternoon. In, five, out, eight. I was dizzy and my joints felt poorly welded together. I stopped again, breathed. I wasn't sure I'd make it, and if I did, I wasn't sure I'd make it back while holding a cup of coffee. I considered whether I could manage the ten paces between me and the coffee. If I made my way through the obstacle course of chairs and booths, I thought I'd be okay, but if I couldn't, if I went down, I didn't know what would happen next. You'd be frightened. More frightened, I thought, than if I returned without coffee. That you might not even notice, so maybe I just wouldn't get the coffee. Are you okay? A man about my age was gazing at me with concern. I must have looked even worse than I felt. Yes, thank you, I'm fine. Are you sure? Can I help you with something? Oh, these fucking Northwesterners. I just said I was fine, but then, oh, she curses a lot. Um, but then I saw the guy was wearing an official looking uniform and discerned that it was his job to help me. So I told him I was working off a leg injury and that I would love to have a cup of coffee, but I was afraid my legs still weren't working. I might have even said something about a triathlon. He said not to worry and helped me back to my seat, then disappeared to fetch me some coffee. And I felt not even slightly guilty that I lied and was just delighted to have someone serve me. And I wondered if this was like what it would be like to be old. When I offered him two dollars for the coffee, he said, again, not to worry, pointed his thumb at you, said, cute kid, and then made his way off to see to other passengers' comfort, a male Florence Nightingale in a Washington State Ferries cap. I loved him. The coffee was good. It's freaking me out that you won't talk about him, I finally said. Why, you said. Look up at me when I'm talking to you, I said. It's rude to read while I'm talking to you. It's rude to talk to me while I'm reading. When did you turn 17, I asked. I'm not 17, you said. But you put down the book and you smiled. You loved it when I accused you of behaving like a teenager. I'm not even seven. You will be soon. I know, you said. You put the book down on your lap and shoved the last of the fries into your mouth. You had ketchup on your chin. You were missing two teeth. You were my little boy again. I think I decided what I want for my birthday, you said. The Lego Millennium Falcon, I said. We settled that weeks ago. Well, you can get me that, you said, but Dad should give me the rancor pit and help me set it up. Dad, I said. You mean Dave? Hasn't he gotten you enough stuff? 
He's my dad, he said. He has to get me a birthday present. That's not all dads do, I said. Their job isn't just to get you stuff. I know, you said, but you said it sadly. You loved stuff. You just loved it. Are you still like this in the future? Or has the odd nexus of loss and privilege you've lived with made you more monastic? I think, if I may insert a little advice here, Jacob, I think it's a nice thing not to attach yourself to too much stuff. First of all, the environment, as I'm sure you know, cannot support the endless manufacture and discarding of so much American crap. As I write this, global warming seems to have reached its tipping point. We're no longer looking suspiciously towards some weird weather someday, but living the weirdness. There have been hurricanes and tornadoes in New York City recently. We don't know whether to burn or to drown, and maybe you'll have achieved some small progress by the time you read this. I don't know. I'm not hopeful. The other thing about stuff that I've learned over the years is the more of it you have, the more of it you want. Stuff breeds stuff. You buy stuff, you have to take care of it. Let's say you buy a car, and then you need to buy insurance and gas and new tires and oil changes, and if you're still in New York, there's parking, it's a nightmare. Rent cars. Borrow when you can. Don't overpurchase, and don't succumb to the adrenaline rush that might accompany purchases or try not to. A trick I use when I'm shopping is just to say under my breath, stuff, stuff, stuff. And suddenly that beautiful set of Heath dinnerware I've been lusting after is just more crap to take care of. I tried to teach you that trick last year, but you were like, Mom, it's not stuff, it's a Lego Death Star, which I guess made sense. You were six. Now that I'd taken your attention from the Jedi Apprentice, I felt like I should have something wise to say about your father, but instead the only thing I wanted to ask you is why you told him you loved him. But I didn't know you'd be, I didn't expect you to be able to explain. I expected you didn't even know, really. What's love to a seven, six-year-old? You looked down in the bottom of the McDonald's bag and were saddened to see there were no more fries. I asked you what you wanted to do in Friday Harbor, and you wanted to do what you always do, go swimming and eat ice cream and see the seals, all of which sounded good to me. I tilted my head back and closed my eyes, and in the blink of an eye, the split of a second, the horn blared, and there we were, a harbor on an island at the end of the world. Are you going to be okay, Mom? You asked me. I opened my eyes. I stood up steadily. I promise I lied and took your hand. One of the books Dr. Susan recommended, A Mother's Light, suggested making a list of all the things you want your family to do when you're gone so they can check things off a list periodically and have an excuse to talk about you. The author advises including such things as see the Christmas tree in Rockefeller Center, climb the tallest mountain in your home state, see the Mona Lisa in the Louvre. Although I cannot imagine personally instructing you to climb a mountain in my honor, I do think about this list more often than I'd like. What sorts of things would I like you to do in your life? Not necessarily so you'd have a chance to talk about me, which I can't figure out how much I'd like you to do. Do I want to be a lingering memory, or will that just make me a millstone? Well, what sort of thing do I think the good life requires? I've come down to just a few things. Be tolerant of other people. Life is just too stressful when every single person you meet annoys you. When people are mean to you, remember that something is probably lacking in their lives, not yours. Check for lumps. Try to get eight hours of sleep at a stretch as often as possible. Be thoughtful about money, fall in love with the right person, read a lot. Try not to do too many stupid things when you're a teenager, if at all possible. I don't really care if you ever climb a mountain. It was almost midnight now, and I was on my second codeine. Nights on this island were so black, they reminded me that I only rarely saw night. My nights in Manhattan were merely grayish, so since so much light spilled out from the streets. But here the sky looked like some lunatic artist sprayed it with glitter. The Milky Way splashed out across the black. You were asleep and Allison was asleep and I was sitting outside on the deck thinking of you and also my father and how he named all the stars when I was a kid, showing me them in the encyclopedia. I pointed them out to myself, Orion the Hunter, the Big and Little Dippers, the Dog Star. I remembered that I wanted to tell you the names of the stars before I went. I wasn't sure Ali knew them. The names really are beautiful, Jacob. Cassiopeia Triangulum. It felt good to put some distance between your father and myself, and even better knowing he'd be on a plane back to New York tomorrow. I kept myself from looking at Facebook to see if he'd recorded any assessments of the afternoon. The internet connection was pleasingly dodgy on Friday Harbor. The pain in my side came and went, and so did the fogginess in my head. I wondered if things were progressing more quickly than the doctor said they would, if they knew this, if they lied to me to keep me from total despair if the surgery I needed was actually the last intervention of my life. It was okay, I thought, if they'd lied to me. I would have lied to me. I was not doing well in those early months, and maybe the right approach, therapeutically speaking, was to lie. Why did Dr. Susan insist on telling you, anyway? I'm still working on that one. Do you remember sitting in her office, the way she leaned forward, the way she said that I was going to get sick, and then sicker? 
the way I might have to go to the hospital, that someday I would no longer be with you in person, but I would be standing next to you in spirit? You weren't even five. She had, you had no idea what she was talking about. You're sick, you asked me? What kind of sick? Cancer, I said. Doesn't that make you die? Your best friend's grandmother had recently died of pancreatic cancer. I, I looked away, I half shrugged. Dr. Susan tried to interject more nonsense about my spirit and how I'd always be, there'd always be someone to take care of you, and etc. But you weren't listening. It was like having one of those horrible dying mother books come to life, sprouting out nonsense about how I'd be there in the rainbows. When? Not for a very long time, I said. Not soon. Like, how old will I be? Eight, at least. So that's three years, you said. You've always been good at numbers. And then I'll live with Aunt Allie and Uncle Bruce. That's right, I said, but not for a very long time. OK, he said. And you didn't say anything else. And when we left, Dr. Susan said that she thought it had gone pretty well, generally speaking. But she wasn't there for your nightmares that night, or the wet bed that morning, or how I walked into your room two days later and overheard you telling Kelly the hamster that you were sorry, but you were going to throw her out the window because it was time for her to die. You want some company? Ross and Camilla, those, that's her niece and nephew. Ross and Camilla didn't hang out together too much in Seattle, but here they were best friends. And though I didn't really want company, I smiled and said sure, because Ross had already pulled up a deck chair beside me and Camilla had sprawled out at our feet. We were quiet for a while, watching the stars emit light that, if I remembered correctly, was almost three million years old. Anybody mind if I smoke this, Ross asked, interrupting a silence that had almost lulled me to sleep. He was holding a small giant, perfectly rolled. Spark it, Camilla said lazily, and I was flattered. The cool kids were smoking around me. Ross lit the joint, inhaled, leaned his back to blow smoke toward the sky. I closed my eyes. I had a small supply of medical marijuana back home, but I rarely used it, preferring the full body fog of codeine. Also, it felt weird getting high around you. You want, Ross asked, passing me the joint. I took it from his hands, thought about saying something like, I shouldn't be doing this, or don't tell your mom, but I said nothing. Put the joint to my mouth, tried not to smell the sickly herbaceousness of it, this was bargain basement weed, and inhaled. I coughed for the tiniest second, but neither of your cousins said anything derisive to me. After a minute, Camilla took the joint from my hand. I waited for a minute to feel groggy or paranoid or anything at all, but there was nothing, really, just a sort of delayed peace. Cutting through the smell of the joint was the memory of the smell of your father and the way it felt to hug him. He was on a plane, and I was on an island, and so I let myself think of him, what it was to see him, how his arms were still strong around me, and how he still missed that spot right under his lower lip when he was shaving. I used to run my finger on that rough spot, a place nobody else would touch or see. If you were curious about my love life before or after your father, I have no idea if this is the sort of thing you'd be curious about, and if it's not, feel free to skip this part. But before your father, I made, dated two men significantly, Howard, 1994 to 98, and Jim, 2001 to 4. And afterward, no one. I had a few flings, I suppose. Men I met on the campaign trails, once a reporter, and for a few lovely weeks, Haven Singleberry's dad. Do you remember Haven, redheaded girl from your kindergarten class? Uh, it was, this was when he and Haven's mom were on a trial separation. This started happening right after drop-off. It was October, still warm, and Haven's dad and I bumped into each other in Starbucks on Amsterdam Avenue in 66th and 76th. He mentioned that casual, direct way that men have when they want sex that his wife had just left for an extended stay at a yoga center in the Berkshires. She was going through something, he said, and needed time away. I was only half listening. That's nice, I said, that your wife's a yogini, as being into yoga is one of those things I had always planned on. My apartment's empty, he said, and looked down into his latte as if he was surprised with himself, although I'm sure he wasn't. I'm working from home today. I have no idea when she'll be back, if, he said ominously, she'll be back at all. <clears throat> Before this, I'd exchanged maybe 20 words with Haven Singleberry's dad, and it must be the THC afterglow. I can't even remember his name right now, but I do remember that he was tall, squarely built. I think he was a screenwriter or something. I'm working from home too, I said. Want to come over? Haven Singleberry's dad, ad dad asked. Sure, I said. And for the next two weeks, every morning after drop-off, drop I would meet Haven's dad at Starbucks, engage in refreshingly little chit-chat, then go home with him to his messy classic six on 70th, and stay there till the housekeeper arrived around noon. And then, as October finally started to cool down, Haven's mom came back from the yoga center, having decided to give it one more chance under certain conditions, and soon after that, the Singleberries moved to Connecticut. You probably have no idea who Haven Singleberry was. The name doesn't ring a bell, but there were moments when I was so dreamy with possibility that I thought maybe one day she'd be your stepsister. 
And then Haven's mom returned, and I never even saw him again or thought about him much. And I guess what I'm trying to say to you, Jacob, is that there is nobody I loved like your father. Sitting under the stars, getting stoned with your cousins. Do not get stoned with your cousins, or if you do, do not drive after. I allowed myself to think about Haven's dad a little, and your dad a lot, until Camilla rolled over and looked at me and said, Holy shit, Aunt Karen, are you okay? Because I was crying. But it seemed hilarious to be getting stoned with someone who still called me Aunt Karen, so I started to giggle. And then Ross and Cammy joined me giggling, even though they didn't know what was funny, and they weren't even that high, but it felt good for all of us to laugh. I laughed enough so that I confused my tears with tears of laughter, and I wiped them off the cheeks with my sleeve. Wow, Ross said, those stars. I always think I'll get used to them, but I never do. Camilla held the very end of the joint between her fingers like a guitar pick. You know their names, right? I said, your mom taught you their names? That's the Big Dipper, isn't it, Ross said? Not at all, I said. What's that one? Cammy asked, stretching an arm dreamily toward the sky. That's Leo, I said, even though I wasn't certain what she was pointing at. If you look to the left a little, you can see his tail. We were all gazing at the stars. I coughed. Then I lifted my shirt to the cool air, ran my hand over the landscape of star scars, some culoidal, some mere traces, that ran across the lower part of my belly. I felt them hold together the leftover pieces of me, like solder on stained glass. Another surgery, then more of me to solder back together. I kept my eyes closed. The stars were so bright and eternal I couldn't face them. My eyes were still closed. I knew what my belly looked like. Pale, shrunken, with leftover set stretch marks. Some of the skin was still stretched out. The scars from my surgery were a pale, rosy cheek, the shade of a lipstick I favored in high school. The scars inside me were adhering to the sides of my empty abdomen. I pressed down on them, tried to feel my way inside, pushed harder even though it hurt. I wanted to reach inside and rearrange it all. Maybe I could fix this all myself. Camilla looked over at me. So how was it with Dave today? Exhausting, I said. Was it weird to see him? Did Jake like him? Jake loved him. It's not hard to, I said, it's not hard to make a kid love you when you bring him enough toys to stock a store. That was smart, bringing toys, said Ross. What else, asked Cammy after a while. There's not much more to say, I said, only half lying, because while someone more articulate in these arenas might have been able to explain my Jackson Pollock of feelings, rage, heartbreak, longing, sadness, patience, grief, sweetness, murder, I didn't know how to even begin. He was a nice guy then, he was a nice guy now. He likes Legos. He seemed really into Jake. Will you see him again? I don't know, I said. I'm sure Jake will want to. I wished I was more stoned. Well, it was nice of you to have done that for him, Ross said. What else could I have done? Anything, I guess, he said. Right? You could have told him anything. Like, his father had gone missing, or that you tried to find him, but you couldn't, Ross paused. You could have said he was dead. Ross, I said. He's going to have a dead mother soon enough. I don't need to kill off his father, too. No, you know, Ross said. Just so that you wouldn't have to see him. I know. <sighs> You're a good mom. I was a good mom. I was a good enough mom. Listen, I said. I need you guys to do me a favor. Of course, they said. Anything. I need you to keep an eye out for Jake, I said. Of course, they said. Of course we would. No, not just the big brother, big brother, big sister stuff, I said. I mean, I need you to keep him with you, keep an eye on him, and you need to be very careful about his dad, okay? Okay, said Cammie, but she sounded confused. Like he cannot go live with his father. He cannot even spend too much time with him. Like he can see him maybe once a year for lunch or something, his high school graduation, but otherwise nothing. Protect him. Got it, Ross said. Why, Cammie said. Because those are my rules, I said. Jesus, how could I have not seen it? I was the dummy. Before I die, after, especially after, his father cannot take him. They were quiet, absorbing this. But I don't think you're really dying, Camilla said. I think they're going to figure out a cure before, before you go, and it's all going to turn out okay in the end. In Guatemala, they see traditional healers, Ross said. I don't know if you've ever tried that. <sighs> Ross, I said. They both giggled a little, and then we were quiet. I waited until the glacier of ice receded from my insides. I took my hand off my stomach, reached for each of their hands. Behind us, someone flipped, out, flipped a switch in the house and cast a block of light down toward where we lay, Bruce getting some water in the kitchen, Allison popping an Andean, in Ambien, wondering where we were. We were on their lawn, holding hands, paper dolls. Listen, I'm asking you guys to please protect Jacob when I'm gone. 
Please teach him about the constellations. Please make sure he reads good books. Please see that he keeps up with his swim lessons. And please don't let his father manipulate him or you, OK? Don't let his father worm his way in. His father wasn't there before, and he doesn't get to be there now just because it feels good to play dad. They didn't say anything. And even if it sounds like I'm being unfair, I don't care. Cammie squeezed my hand. OK, she said. OK, said Ross. And we lay there like that on the grass for what felt like a long time, until Allie opened the back door of the house and yelled that for God's sake it was two in the morning and time to come inside. And then we lay there for a while more, for even longer than that, but I could feel the ice inside me preparing to return. Thank you. I also think that's the longest chapter I've ever attempted, so thank you guys for staying with it. Sometimes when I'm listening to a reading, even if it's really good, at like minute 10, I'm like, woo, this has gone on for a while. So thank you guys for staying with it. Um, you were, I was told there'd be questions. Hmm? Questions? What do you think makes for a good story? If you don't want to stop reading it. That's, that's kind of it. I, I tell my students that and they think I'm kidding, but anything that sort of presses on my center of urgency as a reader, anything I really care about, anything I, I want to know the end to, that I'll keep turning pages. I'm super busy, right? And um, I'm tired, as I've <laughs> And uh, there's a lot of competition for my time. But if there's a really good story and I'm absor absorbed in it, I'm not going to stop reading. And that's how I know it's really good. Um, did you have any inspiration for the characters in the book? I did. Um, Karen herself was inspired by a whole sort of a diverse group of people. Um, a friend of mine who, who ended up dying of ovarian cancer, she's older. Um, she's a political consultant, and I got to sort of tail some political consultants and find out what they do and talk to them about what they do, and that was really neat. And then, you know, part of her, so I started writing this when my son was four, and the, the, the biggest part of this book is really animated by how much she loves her son. Um, and loving a kid like loving any person is complicated, right? Like her love for her son is messy and, you know, um, but it's a pure part of her. And, and I bar that from myself because that's, you know, I love my, my son. Yeah. Don't tell him though because he'd be embarrassed. <laughs> I'm happy to talk about anything, by the way. It doesn't have to be about the book if you just have general writing questions. about the, um, the epistolary form, letters are something I'm really interested in, it's something I, um, I read a lot of letters and I'm curious about um, how literary forms might be related to writing um, letters. Is, is letter writing something you did a lot of as, um, you know, in part of different phases of your life? Yes. Have yeah. You, have you tried? Um, using epistolary techniques in fiction before? Can you just talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. How you think about it? So, um, <laughs> my uh, boyfriend went to, my high school boyfriend went off to college in California. I lived in New Jersey, and this was before we had like email in our house. And he had, I think, the very first email account, but really it was letters. Um, and, and like phone calls still cost money then because I was born in 1800. So I, I um, so we wrote letters. Long, pained, emotive and letters that I look back on and they're, be, they're not, I'm past embarrassment. They're like artifacts of a different, you know. And my grandmother was a wonderful letter writer. She lived in Florida and I remember when I went to college I really enjoyed writing letters to her and getting her funny, witty, erudite letters back. So I always really enjoyed a letter. And I, I transferred for a very long time my letter, my love of the letter to the email, which is not really what email is for, it turns out. But before we knew what email was for, which was basically to set up meetings, I, I thought it was like to communicate harder or to show off my sense of humor, right? I'd write like paragraphs of emails, but I get often really long emails back. Because no one knew, right? Oh, that's not what you're supposed to do with email. You're supposed to just be like, yeah, send. 
which is a long way of saying that I've always loved letters. Um, I love the magic of letters, which which mirrors the magic of fiction, which is like you you are talking to someone when you're not there. You, your brain, the ideas, the, the things you craft in your head are being transmitted magically to somebody else, and you don't even have to be in the room. It's great. Um, this book was written in this format because there's a separate literary tradition which is somewhat literary and somewhat sort of uh, homemade of, of these memoirs that, that families, family you know, like people write to their kids or their loved ones when they're dying. And a friend of mine, her mother, she was 16 when her mother died of breast cancer and she left a series of letter-like letter but long sort of chapters almost to be sent to her at various moments of her life. So there was one for high school graduation, one for college graduation, one for her wedding, one for the birth of her first child. And, and, and the, 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 the chapters themselves became almost uh, burdensome because this mother was writing to a person who was stuck at 15 forever and never allowing for the fact that this person would evolve and become someone, a stranger almost. And I, I thought about that a lot when I was writing this, because Karen's writing to a six-year-old. Who knows how this... And so Karen tries to think about that, like, who will you be when you're 20 and you read this? I don't know. Um, so I wasn't thinking about letters as much as I was thinking about more about the passage of time and the way you try to trap a kid in amber versus letting that kid grow up in your imagination. Um, but because I like writing letters, I think the letter format did come nat naturally. Letters do like a minor version of that, because when you send a yeah. You know, four days. Yeah. Just, you know, weekly. Yeah. That's so interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. What letters? What, what do you study? Like. Uh, yeah, I, I I read poets' letters. Yeah. 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 Poets yeah. raise them the, yeah. the best ones. Um, so my sister lives in Seattle. Um, my sister would like me to broadcast the fact that this is not her. She's very <laughs> self-conscious. She's like, I don't want anyone to think I'm, I'm like, yeah, like, my sister does not have a house on an island. But um, writing a book based in Seattle gave me a tax-deductible reason to visit her a lot, which was quite nice. Um, but that's really not it. I, I love, love, love the, the Pacific Northwest. I spend a chunk of my summer out there with her, we go as often as we can. Um, I have an Alaska Airlines credit card just to earn the miles to get out there. And I, I, I often, when I'm there, will drop, you know, my kids with, like her, her kid, you know, the cousins. They go to camp or they'll play, and I just, my sister's at work, and I'm alone there. In a way, I'm actually never alone here. My sister and her husband um, work full time, and uh, they have camp and babysitters. They have Sort of, so that I can just sort of glom on to. But I don't feel, when I have my own babysitters, I feel like I better be productive. When I'm in Seattle and I'm alone, I feel like I can just explore. And I, I really like that city so much. Um, and I love, even more than I like the city, I love the region. So it was really, I mean, one of the nice things about being a novelist is you kind of get to do what you like, right? So I really like Seattle, so I got to be there in my imagination or in person when I was there. And then I was born in Brooklyn. Um, my father's family was from the Bronx, like we, you know, I went to college in Manhattan and lived in and around New York City my whole life. So, so setting something there just feels easy because I, I know it well and I don't have to do the, the research it would, it would require otherwise. What's funny is that Mercer Island, which is the name of, it's my sister's town and, um, and I just, that's where I set part of it. And I gave a reading in Mercer Island and people were pissed. They were like, you got this street wrong. And I was like, fiction. And they were like, you know. <laughs> Well, how could you do? You just took liberties with our lacrosse team. It's like, uh, no, fiction, fiction. But yeah. When you're working with a format as expansive as a novel, and you're in the process of revising it, what's what's the style and approach that you take? You revise it in, in chunks, by chapters, out of order, in order, front to back, and then how do you know when you're done? So I do read everything. So I, in my first draft, try to write at an, at an insane pace so that I don't lose momentum. So I'll write 10 pages a day when I can. Um, they can be 10 terrible pages. The next day I begin by rereading those pages and not perfecting them, but making them better and then going on and writing my next 10. Um, knowing that the next 10 will not be great, but then 
the day after that I'll go back. Once that process is done, I have a readable but not excellent manuscript. I'll print it out, read it, uh, scribble all over it the way I would with a student's paper, um, put the pages here, type, and just go page by page and input all of the thoughts and try to rewrite scenes and do it. And I do that four or five times at least, sometimes more, print it out, read it, print it out, read it, give the paper to my daughter for scrap because I don't want to waste. Um, and then uh, I give it to my agent, who's a very hands-on editor, and I give it to my editor, who's a very hands-on editor. So by the time it goes from my computer to a bookstore, it's been through many revisions. And yet sometimes it doesn't feel that different after all. Sometimes the spirit of the book hopefully is the same. I'm not great at knowing when I'm done with a book, but I know I'm done with editing when I have to hand it to my agent because if I look at, I just, the words are now blurring together. I've read it so many times I can't see it anymore. Um, and that's a sign for me that no matter what I do, now I'm just like, you know, changing commas or like whatever I do at this point, it's not going to make anything better. And that's how I know I can't do anything more. It's a very good feeling actually. I'm like, well, <laughs> I've taken this dog for a walk or done here. Yeah. <laughs> I hand him books all the yeah. time. He's really sick of it, but yeah, he gets books from me constantly. And Speaking I, of it being age appropriate at given moments. I am not great at age appropriateness, it turns out, and so I've blown it more than once. I gave him, there was a you know, Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, which is a really thoughtful exploration of such topics as the death penalty, but there's a young adult version. He's 10 now, and I, I gave it to him, and he came, and, and he, to his credit, or maybe he has no choice, he's a good reader, so he read it, and then he came, like, bursting in my room at midnight one night. He's like, how can, how, can, how can I do this? If He can't ever see this video. But he was, like, hysterical at the injustice, which is good. He should be hysterical at injustice, but also, like, he shouldn't, I shouldn't be giving him nightmares. So I do love to give him books. It's one of my great joys as a mom to be like, read this, read this, read this. Um, I just gave him yesterday The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, which I think is a wonderful book for for a 10 year old who likes to read and he read a hundred pages, like I'm bragging, but he read a hundred, you know, he just sat because it's so absorbing and, and, uh, and when he doesn't like a book that I really liked, I'm annoyed. Like it's, but, um, and the only books I don't want him to read are mine because it's psychodrama. But, but other than that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've found some of the best, you know, the best company in my life is in books. So it's nice to share that with him. Yeah. Part of have you then discovered books that you loved as a kid that you would want him to read, but as you look at them again or read them with him, you realize you think to yourself, what was I thinking? No, I had excellent taste as a child, so <laughs> that doesn't happen. Uh, no, in fact, the, the books I've been fortunate, actually, the only book that I thought didn't hold up quite as well as I remembered is The House of the Clock and Its Walls, which oh. I super loved as a kid, and I was like, eh, as a, as a grown-up. But I gave him, for the files of Miss Basley Frankweiler, I gave him The Westing Game, which is unbelievable. Um, and then, you know, and then he asked me to read, like, Rick Reardon. And I was like, oh, do I have to? And he was like, yes. And so I, you know, okay. Um, but no, a lot of the books that are still in print from my childhood, they only last if they're kind of good. So, like, a supper piece lasts because it's, it's good. Um, I'm not going to make him read The Babysitter's Club, even though I was super into it. Same with... Sweet Valley High. But, uh, you know, I mean, he's a typical 10-year-old, right? He loves Fortnite. He has this, like, headset at home, and he's, like, they call it, he's, like, a day trader. That's what he's, like, he just, he's at home, like, shouting things into a headset and, like, killing things. I don't know. Um, so it feels great when his hour is up, and I'm, like, turn that off. And, and fifth graders don't get enough homework, really. He doesn't have that much. So... And he's not allowed to get screens anymore, so it's either talk to me, which is not, or he reads, and that's good. Or like watch his sister, or so he reads. 